I'm honored and delighted to welcome our next guest. Uh, her name is Miata Fanbule. She is an economist and the chief executive of the New Economics Foundation. Um, she has a master's and a PhD in economic development from the London School of Economics and a BA in philo philosophy, politics and economics from Oxford. And Miata Fanbule has been one of the driving forces, I uh, should say, behind the movement to build back better in the, in the UK. Miata, um, so good to see you. Thank you for joining us. And thank you uh, so much for having me. It's, it's great to have you. Um, and she will be talking to Katarina Lima de Miranda. Uh, Katarina is the research director of the Council for Global Problem Solving, a think tank uh, network that is uh, connected to the Global Solutions Initiative, and it is providing policy advice to the G20 and other international organizations. Katarina is also a postdoctoral researcher at the Kiel Institute for the World Economy and the co-creator, uh, together with Professor Dennis Noor, of the uh, so-called Recoupling Dashboard, a research tool to measure the well-being of societies beyond just GDP. Um, Katarina Miata, I'm immensely looking forward to your conversation and um, um, uh, looking forward to the questions for, from our audience as well. Thank you so much, Ole. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a particular pleasure to be here with Miata. So uh, we have already heard a little bit uh, from your background, Miata, and now you're chief executive at the New Economics Foundation, which has the mission to transform the economy so it works for people and the planet. And the way um, Miata and I have um, thought about uh, this conversation is to go a little bit backward and to see what is your um, past. So where did you start off and where did you get the motivation to think about why we need to transform the economy? Why is it not working for people? And what can we do for the planet? So I would like to ask you, Miata, where is your motivation coming from? And, and how did you develop this passion for um, economic realignment? Good, good question. Uh, so it, it definitely stems from my background. Uh, so I, I was born in Liberia. Um, my mom's from Sierra Leone. I sort of spent my early years in Sierra Leone. Uh, and both are countries that have been kind of savaged by war, uh, where you see kind of levels of poverty um, and inequality that uh, are just breathtaking. And so I kind of grew up with a sense that there was something fundamentally wrong and unfair with that. Um, you know, growing up at the dinner table, we would talk about uh, politics and social justice and change in Africa uh, in a way that just meant that it was kind of baked into my DNA. So I always knew I wanted to go into public service. That was always clear to me. Um, but I actually thought I'd uh, end up going into international development because, uh, you know, I sort of looked at the world and I thought, well, countries where there are more problems. And if I can make a contribution there, that would be great. Uh, so I started off you know, both my academic training, but my sort of early career was very much in the international development space. Um, and I stumbled on UK policy by kind of accident. Um, I was working for a thing, uh, I was sort of doing development consultancy. Uh, and one of my sort of first big jobs was working in post-conflict Bosnia, which was pretty hardcore. Um, and we were trying to set up a kind of strategy and economic function um, in the prime minister's office uh, to try and do economic analysis and think about economic strategy and try to put it in place uh, across the government uh, and came up with lots and lots of problems. Uh, and, you know, just one day I was sort of looking at The Economist uh, and scanned the sort of job adverts. I saw this thing called the prime minister's strategy unit. I was like, oh, this is what we're trying to create uh, in the UK, it exists. Uh, it'd be brilliant to go there for a couple of years, get best practice, and then come back into international development. And I sort of started and I, I, I got sucked in, um, partly because I think doing the job, you kind of realise that actually there is just endemic inequality um, at home and there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and I got to work on some really, really interesting areas. Um, but I sort of look back at, you know, I spent about 10 years working at the heart of government in the cabinet office um, for three different prime ministers. And I think at the end of that period, the thing that struck me was we were doing lots of really good work, but a lot of it felt like in the margins. We would sort of identify a problem that was this big systemic problem, 
And then we would come up with solutions that sort of tinkered, they triangulated, they dealt with it on the edges, but they didn't fundamentally solve the problem. And I found that deeply frustrating. Um, and, and then it became clear to me that actually shifting our politics was a key part of that. You know, as an official, you can advise, but in the end, the, the, the impetus for big change comes from uh, our politicians. Uh, and that's the things that kind of motivated me to take the jump from public policy in an official capacity to trying to you know, work for the leader of the opposition at the time, uh, to try and shape policy in opposition. Uh, uh, and then to this world where you know, we have the space to try and shift our politics. Uh, so the motivation has always been the same. We've got to try and make the world better. Um, the means by doing that, I think, has changed in my career. So, so you ended up staying in the UK, actually, and, and I working did. there. I did. I think I was directed development eventually, <laughs> but I, I've got stuck in. There's a lot of work to do. <laughs> well, you're still young, so there's a lot of time to continue your work and who's, uh, who knows uh, where you will end up someday. Um, so, so now you're at the New Economics Foundation. And can you tell us a little bit about your work there and what what is the mission that you're doing uh, what is the focus of your of your personal work and then also from the organization? So um, what are the topics that you're dealing with at the moment? Yeah, so I mean, NEF has existed uh, for 30 years and it's, it's a strange organization for me because actually we've been really consistent in our mission. Uh, in that 30 year period, it's always been to transform the economy so it works for people on planet. It's not a small mission, it's a pretty massive mission, but we've been consistent in that. and. For a long time, you know, we were a kind of outlier organization. Our job was not in the mainstream. We were challenging the mainstream and we were both challenging it in terms of a critique that in the end, the problem is economic model. You could do a whole lot of stuff to try and tackle inequality or poverty or climate and environmental breakdown. But unless you change the model, you'll only be putting a plaster over the symptoms. So that was always our role. And then to try and come up with kind of visionary ideas. Uh, about about the world as it could be rather than the world that it is. And when I joined the organization about three and a half years ago, the thing that really struck me was the mainstream debate had massively changed. And actually our problem definition, the idea that actually this economic model doesn't work for people on planet, had sort of gained resonance across the political spectrum. So it was the time where on, you know, in this country, on the kind of Labour side or um, on the left, we had you know, Jeremy Corbyn, the Labour Party saying the economy works for the few, not the many. On the Conservative side, we had you know, a Conservative Prime Minister saying the economy doesn't work for everyone. So I sort of came in and said, well, you know, the arguments we've been prosecuting have been won. The challenge now is what's your alternative? If this thing is bust, you know, what, what are we trying to get to? And what's the route map? How do we go from the world that we are now to the alternative that we want to create? And that's basically been my project in my time at NEF, um, trying to help us develop the policy perspectives for, for, for what that looks like. Um, and I think the two things in terms of the specifics that we're working on, uh, you know, our, our, our guiding principle has been that it feels like we're at a tipping point. So the combination of climate breakdown, where we are now, you know, it's, it's long in the making, but we are now, you know, we, we, we've run out of road. We've run out of road. So the impacts of that, that will start feeling quite visceral and tangible, plus the impacts of you know, the economy on people. Uh, we've always had poverty, but the thing that I think has really focused the minds in the last decades and a bit since the financial crisis is the fact that across the piece, what we've seen is living standards haven't budged. You know, so it was always, you, know, you grow the economy, and yes, those at the top did really well, but everyone did incrementally better. And that stopped happening. That stopped happening for over 10 years. And our sense of that, income crisis, the climate crisis, and then a kind of a breakdown in our democracy and trust in our democracy was heading us towards change anyway. Um, and so it felt like the ground was fertile. We were in a moment. And the question is, how do you use that moment to kind of galvanize these forces for change? Um, and then the pandemic hit. And I think that has just, in some respects, amplified a lot of the things that we were talking about. And I think forged an even stronger consensus for change. So. Our work is focused on kind of three core things. Uh, there is a big piece which is around how do we do the green transition? So everyone's now talking about a green recovery. That's great. How do we do a green uh, recovery in a way that is accelerated first? So our ambition has to be greater than net zero at 2050, but that's just that you actually improve people's lives while you do it. Um, and there's a huge package of work that we're trying to do uh, to try and make the government both ambitious in terms of what it's trying to achieve, 
but bake in social justice within, within an environmental agenda. The second bucket for us is what we're calling a new social settlement. Um, and at its core, there are sort of three planks of that, um, or, we, or social guarantee is the language that we're now using. On the one hand, it's ensuring that we have an income level that you achieve through your social protections, your social security system, the, below which we say no one can fall. You know, an income level below which people don't have to go to a food bank to feed their kids, or don't have to choose between heating their homes and feeding their children. Um, and that's just baked in and accepted. Um, alongside that, you have a combination of, you know, a, a, an adequate living wage, uh, plus action to try and drive wages across the labour market with labour market reform. And then the third component of that is what we call a well-being state, or the idea that there is a basket of core services that we all need that are foundational for everyone to have a good life. Um, and that comes together as a social offer to everyone. Every citizen gets that, um, and it's accepted across the political spectrum. And then the final sort of strand of our work um, has focused on what we call the kind of democratic economy. Um, and that's essentially how do we confer power, both in terms of how the state works by pushing power down into communities and local organizations, but in the economic sphere, where actually we have a world with a power imbalance between consumers and users and ordinary people and shareholders is hugely out of whack and workers is out of whack. So how do you, through shifts in ownership models and other interventions, change the power imbalance and give people a greater stake? And those are the kind of three core planks uh, of, of, of the work that we're trying to drive over the next five years. Wow, a very ambitious plan. Um, so yeah. let's, see. <laughs> <laughs> let's see, um, but, but um, I mean, we need to be ambitious, right? If, if, if we want to achieve a change, uh, I guess now it's a good time with the pandemic. So we, there is action required. It's not like, yeah, we can do something in the future, but it's really necessary to do something now. So there's some kind of momentum. And what I would uh, like to dig in first is, let, um, I understand that the NAF has like a bottom-up approach, right? So it's rather like we need civil society movements in order to push the politicians to, to actually um, implement uh, some new rules, a new system. Um, maybe you can develop a little bit further on, on this bottom up and um, how you see like the society, the society's role in, in this uh, process. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, our, our thesis, our theory of change is that the way that we shift the economic system is by changing the rules of the economy. Um, and that requires us to get the politics to do some quite big and ambitious things uh, to gear the system in favor of people rather than uh, the interests that it's currently geared towards. But, you know, you don't shift the politics unless you can mobilize people to demand something. Um, and all my time in working in policy um, and politics, I think my big takeaway is the thing that moves politicians is the power um, of public opinion and the power of social movements mobilizing. Um, and the example I always give is, you know, if you take uh, if you take climate change, you know, we had the, the big NGOs that were chipping away, trying to get the government to be ambitious. And, it, you know, it took a combination of kids taking to the streets saying this is our future, enough is enough, um, uh, and Extinction Rebellion to completely shift the dial. We would have never got 2050 in legislation had that not happened. So social movements are really powerful. And the work that we're trying to do at NEF around Build Back Better coming into the recovery is, you know, there was actually quite a lot of consensus. Uh, you know, we... Last year, we we sort of, we were part of pulling together an alliance of about 300 organisations from all the big business organisations, the CBI, the British Chambers, all the major trade unions, all the big civil society organisations and faith groups around Build Back Better. And there was quite there was huge unanimity around what the core components of what people wanted to achieve were. You know, green tackle inequality, social settlement. But, we were all really fra fragmented and fractured. So everyone is pushing for the same goals, but we're not working together. There is no coordinated campaign. There is no social movement driving the work of the kind of big established NGOs. And we thought, well, this is, this is kind of mad. <laughs> there is an opportunity. And this, this is our change model, which says, if you can, you know, if you have a line of sight to the change that you're trying to create at the national level, this, like, the rules that you're trying to change, or the you know, bits of legislation or bits of policy, and then if you can galvanize movements that are there anyway, you know, our job is just to go and work with people who are mobilizing um, and, and, and sort of help give definition to that mobilization, because often people mobilize against something. 
uh, they don't always mobilize for something. So we try and say, you know, we're against this, but actually, what's your alternative to make it better? And can you rally people around the thing that you're fighting for? And if you can create that social pressure that then punctuates into public opinion and shift public opinion, that's the thing that the politicians are most scared of. So the way that, you know, you get the politicians to act, you, you might be lucky, you sometimes you get, you know, politicians generally trying to do the right thing, but whether they're bold enough and ambitious enough to do it the scale that you want them to is another matter. And sometimes you might just get politicians that do that, but often they're responding to the politics. And so a big part of what we're trying to do is like, not just developing the ideas about the alternative, but actually working to create the groundswell of support that can shift the politics to make that alternative a reality. So I see that for when you think about green recovery and um, Fridays for Future movement, we see that there's kind of a common goal and people are getting more and more aware of what we want to achieve, right? Now for the social domain, I think it's more difficult and um, less clearly defined of what, what are actually the goals that we want to achieve. Well, less inequality, for sure, the living standard, for everyone that is uh, a good living standard. Um, and uh, do you have a, an idea of what, how can we formulate an alternative for the social domain in order to like gather sufficient social pressure to, to get politicians to, to act on that? Yeah, like yeah what, that's, what is... yeah, that, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, and it's a question that we're living and breathing in real time because uh, you know, when we were thinking about the work that we want to do coming out of the recovery, and it was very clear what the, the kind of, if you like, what the, the parameters were on the green recovery. On the sort of social side, you know, there was a basket of stuff that was around public services, there was a basket of stuff that was moving towards inequality, and it was quite diffused, and actually the actors are massively diffused. Um, and so we've been kind of struggling with this, uh, if I'm honest, and I think where we've landed is, and, and in part reflecting our politics, we're in, part reflecting the composition of the government that we have and what we think we can achieve. It, it feels to us like there are two things that we're trying to do in this space. One is this kind of living income campaign. Um, and what we're trying to do is take it out of, you know, a lot of the debate on poverty tends to become quite technocratic. A lot of the debate on welfare becomes quite technocratic in a way that you just can't move people. You know, the, the ins and outs of how the social security system does not animate anyone to go and fight for that cause. Um, and we think of the, the principle of a living income, a kind of right that every citizen should have, the thing that we want for our fellow citizens is something we can galvanize. And, you know, for us in policy detail, that's, you know, an income level that's about, uh, that's about uh, 227 pounds uh, per person per week, which is about four times what our current kind of social security provision is, but we don't go into that. We're trying to win the principle. Um, and then once you unlock that, in order to deliver that, there are a whole other set of things that you would need to do on housing, et cetera. But it creates a route by which you open into wider policy change that you want. Um, and then in the kind of, you know, the, the thing that we're calling the, the service offer, where we still need to do more work and thinking. And we're torn between going in on, you know, flanks like care. You know, there's a big bit of work that we need to do to kind of universalize care, ensure that it's of a standard that people are taking care of that are working in the care sector. Uh, and it's, do you do that? Do you go for tactical wins in particular things? Or do you, do you, do you go for, you know, what we call universal basic services? You know, there is just, there is this basket of things. Actually, which to be fair, in a lot of social democratic countries that you see, um, it's being eroded, but it exists. Um, and for us in the UK, it's been massively denuded over the last 10 years. Uh, and if you like the, 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 the social guarantee, the, the universal, the basket of universal services have been narrowed down. And our argument is actually there are just some things and you chuck in there childcare, which you know we have in some countries we don't have here, which is insane. Social care, you throw in housing, that should be a basic requirement and right. You throw in public transport because who can exist if we don't have a problem? And that becomes a thing. And we say we fund that collectively through taxation um, and everyone has universal equal access to it. Um, that's where we want to get to. The thing is, how do you create a campaign that can excite and animate people? Because uh, even that feels quite technocratic. So that, that is still work in progress. This is a long way of answering your question, which is really hard. It's really hard. We think we've got one flank of it. 
we need to work on the other track. <laughs> yes. But maybe, so I, so I feel that um, with the pandemic, um, a lot of things like came into life, right? Especially in the UK, when you think about the um, health care system, then the pandemic created a momentum to see, well, maybe we should stop eroding uh, the social security system, the social health system, and really invest into that. So do you think that the pandemic has created a momentum that some changes that maybe one or two years back wouldn't be feasible are now more closer to become reality? A hundred percent. You know, I've been completely taken back by how quickly and fundamentally the debate has changed and the policy debate has changed over the course of the pandemic. Um, and I think the two two things that are driving it are, as you say, it's just, you know, it's shone this glaring spotlight on a whole load of problems that were there in quite a visceral way. Um, underinvestment and social care is suddenly seen in, you know, in bright lights and in really sort of tragic lights that I think focuses the minds um, on the one hand. And then on the other, you know, the fact that in this country, but in country over country, we've had governments that have had to do the unthinkable. You know, the idea that you could have got a conservative government, and we had the, you, you had your version of the fellow scheme in Germany, and we always used to look in envy and thought, gosh, there's no way in the world you would ever get a conservative government to do something like that. But the fact that it did, a whole set of interventions, I think has, you know, the answer to some of the things that we ask for is just, it's not possible. You know, we can't afford to do it. It's not, there are all these reasons you can't. And suddenly the impossible is possible when there's a political will. And I think that has kind of blown things up. So those two things I think are driving a new conversation and consensus. And we did some polling a little while ago that showed that only 6% of the country didn't want change. And that's, that's quite shocking because generally, even when people aren't happy, people are quite scared of change. And so to have that uh, an overwhelming majority of people wanting some change, I think is a kind of a sense of the times. I think the challenge now is, it feels like the pandemic has created the ca uh, conditions for us to push for some pretty big things. And I think where we are, is it's a question of how long that will hold. You know, it feels like there's a window um, there's a window in which the ground is fertile to try and win big change. And I think it will close, um, partly because, you know, people do want to go back to normal, uh, even though the old normal was awful. Uh, people are just sick and tired of, of, of this new world. Uh, you've got a government that's very tired, um, but also a government that doesn't necessarily believe in big change. I think the risk for us here and you know, I think comparing us to say the US is quite interesting because there you do have a government that seems to be stepping into the moment to shift the paradigm a bit. And we don't have that here. So we've got a tiny window to try and work with others to mobilize political pressure to get them to do some of the things. And you know, for us, if you like the three wins that we're trying to lock in are uh, you know, a green recovery. They say they want to do that. Let's make it real and make it ambitious. Um, there's a defensive attack for us, which is our biggest worries that we go back into austerity and we've got to fight that uh, because if we go back into austerity mode, our capacity to do anything else is massively muted. Uh, and then the third for us is this income piece, uh, which is the thing that we think will bubble long after the pandemic and that we think the government will have a blind spot, um, but they've got to confront and we've got to make them confront um, and thinking about what you know, a living income would look like in that context. I don't think we'll achieve a living income in the next five years, but I think we can take steps towards it that creates the basis for us to kind of build on in the future. Yeah. So, so I find it interesting when you say there's like a narrow window and we need to act now. And I think it relates very well, like as well to like the decaying democracy. And I think this is one of the pillars that, that you work on as well, right? So if we see that the society is somehow drifting apart, maybe because income equality is growing within countries, which is what we see, right? Um, and then the um, medium income of a whole population group has stagnated and is not increasing anymore. So people get frustrated. And I mean, it's not the entire cause, but it also is one of the causes for the Brexit, I guess. 
so that people are dissatisfied. Now, can we create and use this moment as well to somehow unite the society and try to like bring democracy to the forefront again and try to build consensus in the society um, so that together we can like create something new? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm an optimist. So I, I generally believe it can be done. You know, I think the fault lines are clear. So there, there is a lot of anger and dissatisfaction even before the pandemic. And, you know, for me, Brexit was a symptom of that. You know, Brexit was never really about the European Union. It was a lot, a lot of people saying we're tired of the social settlement. Um, and, and then, you know, you had a part of our politics that used that in order to you know, make it about the European Union. But that anger, uh, that frustration hasn't gone away. And, you know, the pandemic would have made it worse. And it's been the the kind of the 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 pain the economic pain has been masked by the public health the health pain and the health story but the economic pain is still there um, and it's going to be there long after and you know for me the Probably stat getting that, worse with the crisis yeah and the stat that scares me the most um, you know so our economic watchdog the office of budget responsibility their last projections uh, projected that average wages wouldn't go back with would only reach 2008 levels in uh, 2026, which means we would have gone for nearly 20 years in which average wages haven't. I mean, that, that is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, and I, and I, and I, you know, and I think all of that is bubbling up. And I think all of that will have to find. Um, it will have to find a vent. And the risk is that you know you have populist reactionary parts of our politics that come in and use that to divide, which is kind of where our politics in this country has been, or you can galvanize people around something hopeful um, and around something different. And I think the work that, you know, organizations like ourselves can do in terms of organizing that we do on the ground, but in the end, what we need our politics to do as well is unite people around um, something positive, another world is possible, you know, the politicians like using that phrase, but, you know, that people can believe in. Um, and then I've increasingly, it's interesting, up to now, I've sort of been in the view that, of course, we need to reform our democracy, and we need to think about things like electoral reform, but, you know, it can also be a distraction, because that is like a 10-year project that doesn't get you to the economic outcomes you want. So I'm like, let's fix the economics first. And increasingly, I'm of the view that actually you need people to have trust and faith in the system. And so you can't, you know, you can achieve economic reform, but you've also got to try and do democratic reform because the anger is born out of the fact that people feel that things aren't working for them and yet they don't believe that there's a route to change or to make it better. There's a recognition that the system is geared against them. The politicians are useless. There's no point in voting or engaging, they're all the same. And that's massively corrosive. So I think you've got to, You've got to do both and there is the opportunity to both but we need forces that are working to galvanize people around the positives um, as opposed to the dividing us around the negatives yes so that's precisely the spirit of the global solution summit right to realign and to recouple economic and social progress because if they too drift apart then you get a society that is fragmented you get social conflicts you get inequality around the world so so this goes into exactly the direction that we are all um, here for at the actually at the summit and I see that there are um, some questions in the chat so I would like to invite Peter first uh, to unmute and uh, switch on his camera to ask a question to Miata. Hi Miata and hi everyone. Uh, my name is Peter as it's uh, the best. I'm from Nigeria and I'm really glad to meet you on this ah. platform. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, my key concern is the issue of addressing the realignment of the economy, especially within the crisis. I've seen that in Nigeria, where uh, people are more educated, they have uh, better social study and economic uh, uh, background as compared to those, those with low literacy. So do you think that uh, addressing the issue of education could be a, could be a fundamental step that could help to the realignment of Economy, especially with this crisis. Very good question. Very good question. Yes, yes, in short. Um, and I think, and I think there are two routes to this. Um, I think, in part, 
uh, you know, I think education is important anyway because it kind of it, it opens up it opens people up to the possibilities and different possibilities. Uh, but I think there's a particular piece around economics, um, and you know, we've been working with organisations like Rethinking Economics and others because our, our if you like our assessment is part of the reason why people don't fight against the system is that you know, people find the economy really baffling and complex and obscure. And, you know, we did a bit of work about five years ago called Framing the Economy, where we talked to lots of different people, actually in lots of countries, just to understand the way they thought about the economy. And the, the three messages that came out was, we don't get it, it's this thing. Um, secondly, powerlessness. So rather than feeling that we are all actors in the economy and therefore we have agency to change the economy, there was this thing that it's just there and it's like powerful forces are there and there's nothing we can do. And the third was resignation. Um, it is that way and there's nothing that we as individuals or even if we club together collectively can do and all of that is corrosive to change. So I think part of the piece on education is demystifying the economy. Um, and, you know, economists don't help, I, you know, I, I, as a sort of economist myself, there is a whole jargon and lexicon that I think is there just to <laughs> confound and be baffle people so that no one really understands what we're talking about, we sound important. Uh, so all of that needs to be demystified. Um, and then, and so that people understand that actually the economy is just a set of rules and how we all interact with that rules and both we can change the rules, but also we can change our interaction to shift the economy. And I think that gives agency and power. Um, and that is the core step to getting people to mobilize for change. Uh, and if you can't, if you, if you don't have that level of political education, because that's kind of what it is, it's much, much harder to mobilize people around changing this thing that just feels so huge, so all encompassing and so powerful and so out of their control. So I think education for the good in, in any case, um, and for sort of, helping to build our understanding of what's possible, but education to demystify this thing so that we can mobilize people around an alternative. Thank you so much, Miata, and thank you, Peter, for the question. And I, I just wanted to like uh, confirm this. I think empowerment is really important as well. So if you give people the capabilities of choosing, of understanding, of uh, mobilizing forces, um, this creates a momentum, this also creates some sort of social belonging and uh, coalizing that people work together. So, um, yeah, very, very important. Um, now we also have a question from Navam. Navam, would you also like to switch on your camera and uh, turn on your mic? I, uh, I hope that the camera is working. This connection is a bit shaky, but... Um... I mean, thank you so we, much. We are hearing you well. All right, great. That, that's great. <laughs> uh, thanks, Miata, for that uh, wonderful discussion. I mean, you know, I, I agree with you that, you know, basically, you know, what's econ economically aspirational also really depends on your work with these, uh, I mean, in your case, you said three former prime ministers, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> so I mean, that, that's an interesting dynamic. I mean, you know, so, uh, I mean, I, I wonder how how long, I mean, yes, the pandemic has happened. We've seen conservative governments, you know, take more, uh, you know, left-wing center, center-left uh, decisions. I, I just, in your opinion, especially in the case, I think is particularly relevant in, uh, you know, the UK and maybe even the US where you still have, you know, divided government, uh, especially in the Senate and Germany and France even. Um, you know, how, how permanent do you, I mean, is this a long-term trend or is this something that you see to be more temporary, especially because, I mean, the Labour Party in 2019, they explicitly embraced many of the, uh, you know, kind of social interventions, protections that you were just talking about, uh, and, and they've not been doing so well. Is this, a, is this trend going to be problematic for your aspirations? Or, you know, just as you mentioned, do you see hope in conservative governments moving closer to that, occupying that space that is kind of being left there? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, excellent question. Um, and that is the million dollar question, um, to be honest with you. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, you know, my optimist in me says this is to stick and there's a shiver, uh, there's a pivot. Um, and I think the thing that backs that up is broadly, you know, certainly all the polling we've done in this country is that the public are broadly left on the economy. Um, so, you know, things like a sort of totemic issue, you know, it's not viewed as a lefty thing, it's just viewed as a, 
uh, you know, is a common sense thing. So in some respects, to the extent to which you have governments that are trying to align with their public, uh, you'd expect to see the shift. Um, but equally, you know, some of these interventions, the things that have been forced on governments that aren't naturally interventionist in the pandemic has been deeply uncomfortable. And if I take our government here, yes, they've done the furlough scheme. Yes, they've, you know, they've invested 320 billion in their pandemic response, but they've hated every single minute of doing it. Um, it is a, it's against the grain of where the party is. And there is a strong kind of back, 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 back faction that are like, this is madness and we need to pivot back. And what I'm not clear about, and you know, in this country in particular, the dynamics of conservative governments making wins in traditional labor heartlands kind of shifts it. But I think it's the same story globally. You know, you have governments of all persuasion essentially acting in a very interventionist, sort of traditionally social democratic left way, um, and some being really uncomfortable if they've had to do it. Now, you know, I hope the combination of the fact that they've had to do it and actually the necessity of it has meant that in some respects as awful as the pandemic has been and as awful as a lot of the outcomes have been and as much as many governments have failed it could have been so much worse if they hadn't done that and that in itself locks in that the, the you know we, we had this silly argument about markets and states for years which is like it's never one or the other like it, it, but this proves that that is completely academic because at some point you need state intervention and actually the vaccine program is a classic example of markets and states working together in quite an effective way to do with the impossible so i hope that all shifts the paradigm and that sits but i think there is a i think there is a huge um ideological battle to be fought uh, as, as different parties reconcile themselves with the new reality and some will feel comfortable with it and will own it. Uh, others will have reactions against it. Um, and I suspect where they end up will be where their public are. Um, so to the extent that there is a consensus from the public that we need a different sort of paradigm, that's where I'm hopeful. Um, I think it will stick because the public are broadly there. Um, but I think it's going to be really messy. Um, and you know, if I had to predict where the Conservative Party will be here or where you know centre-right parties will be in other countries that have you know leaned to, to do the sort of interventionist social democratic side, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, my hope is this is the beginning of a paradigm shift. Um, and all we can do is activate and work to make sure that shift sticks. You know, you make changing the current mode uncomfortable and painful. So even though ideologically you want to do it, there is so much public pressure to not do it that it sticks. And then after five years, 10 years, it just becomes a norm. And then you have a new consensus. And then within that consensus, you'll have, you know, the progressive side wanting to go further, the conservative side not so, but at least we're working on a different plane, um, you know, in my head, the 1945 consensus was one that kind of leaned towards interventionist social democratic principles. And actually that was held by both the left and the right. And you had differences within that. Then we then had the kind of neoliberal phase where, again, that consensus was held by both the left and the right. And you had degrees within that. I hope we're moving to a new consensus that locates it within, you know, an intervention state working with markets, but to drive some social outcomes. And then it's fine if you've got modifications within that, but, but it's all to play for. <laughs> it's all to play for. Thank you so much, Navam, for this question. And uh, I think uh, we do see that some at some points the narratives are changing, right? So this can also lead to a system change and can lead to politicians uh, and parties to, to adapt new narratives and go into directions that we might uh, desire. So there's another question by Nguyen. Um, please unmute yourself and if you can switch on your camera. Yeah. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, very well. Sure. Hi, Mata. Um, I was afraid my question would be a bit too fundamental or radical, but because now that you mentioned a paradigm shift, so I want to ask, I mean, I'm not an economist, but you know, I'm an urban planner and we have some economic class. So my basic knowledge of economic is you, we always work with a set of assumptions, you know, to try to narrow down the model and try to predict it as sharp as possible. So my question would be um, with this pandemic or, you know, one is, is one is has been done, 
uh, when it is over, um, what is what do you think is the main uh, assumptions about current economics uh, models being used should be challenged or should be changed um, to you know better uh, you know deal with uh, a post um, COVID economy? Yeah, very very good, really good question. Um, and, um, and, and if you're not familiar with them, uh, uh, INET, the Institute for New Economics Thinking, uh, is doing some really, really great work um, looking at just the ridiculousness of some of our assumptions that kind of imbue all of our economic models and how uh, like completely detached from the reality of the world that we have, they are. And yet it's a thing that so much is built on. Um, I think for me, how much of this is hope and how much of this is truth? Uh, so <laughs> it's somewhere in between. I think for me, the, 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 the three things that I think have been quite interesting in the pandemic and I think will shift assumptions is the balance between uh, well-being and growth. Uh, so we have had an extra, you know, for, given that our whole economic model and frame and everything we learn about economics has been about, you know, maximizing certain directions to drive growth. We've had the most profound thing where governments the world over have essentially opted to shut down their economies in the well-being of their people. And it's a no brainer of course they would, uh, but that completely throws our economic model up, upside down, right? So, you know, in the end, the thing was, that was paranoid was our well-being, our health, you know, our security, our safety. And if that is the most important thing, you then have to ask yourself, well, why are we constructing all of our economics and everything around growth and GDP? Um, and so I hope the thing that sticks is a recalibration um, of what is important uh, in economic terms and a rebalancing of well-being versus growth, because um, uh, I think that has been the most kind of profound takeaway. I think the second thing has been, you know, all of our economic assumptions is based around uh, individuals uh, acting rationally to optimize uh, certain outcomes. And yet the pandemic response has been a phenomenal collective response, uh, where actually many of us have been putting individual self-interest uh, to one side for the collective. And again, you know, that is the normal reality. I think that holds and sticks. And I think that is something that will sort of shift the assumptions uh, that, 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 that we make. Um, and then I think, you know, the third, the, the third, the third set of things is just the, the, the pace of economic change. I mean, you know, the, 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 the scale of economic change that we've seen in a short space of time has been absolutely profound. Sectors turned upside down in no time, in a way that as an economist, you just, this stuff happens over 10 years. Like these are whole... And I think that uh, economic change and transition is another big assumption um, and both how it plays out, but also how you respond and how quickly you need to respond. So I think, you know, for people who are thinking about economics or public policy through the lens of economics, I think those are the three assumptions that are, you know, they, they are endemic in our paradigm and they've all been shaken um, and we would be mad this is where it's more hope than maybe truth. We would be mad not to reflect on them and think, actually, perhaps we should shift some of these assumptions, or at least the pandemic has taught us we maybe should shift some of these assumptions. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Nguyen. I think this was a kind of already a perfect closing statement, Miata. So we have a momentum for a system change, um, a paradigm change. Um, we. I think we can all work on that and try to make this reality. Um, you are at the forefront, I would say, uh, with your institution, with your think tank and doing great work. Uh, very impressive. Thank you so much for uh, being with us and uh, answering all our questions. Um, thank you everyone for watching.